Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and drones. <laughs> Please be seated. Drones, you can keep flying around. I'm Don Tapscott, and I'm the Chancellor of Trent University, and I'm also a proud graduate. And um, I've had, I guess, more than my share of honors in my life so far, but there's been no greater honor than to be the first alumni chancellor of this great institution. And I'd like to begin by thanking uh, Mother Nature for delivering this fabulous day for us and placing just the right number of clouds so we don't all roast here. So if we could bring it on for Mother Nature, please, that would be really great. Um, yo, Mama. <clears throat> I'm one of four Tapscott boys that graduated from this university two years apart. And um, I hitchhiked over from Aurelia, Ontario one Saturday in the spring of 1966 to check out this, it was called the Oxford on the Autonomy, a new little school in Peterborough, Ontario. And I fell in love and I'm very happy that I came here. And students graduating this week are sharing a special milestone with us. This convocation marks the official end of our 50th anniversary year. And it's been a great year, and, and ending it by uh, celebrating your graduation is a kind of perfect way to wrap it up. Uh, for 50 years, Trent has been challenging the way we think. It's also been challenging learning itself. And today, more than ever, I have good news for you, Trent graduates are in demand. And I know that many of you have made, a, all of you have made a big investment, as many of the parents here, in your university education, especially those of you in the red outfits in the front. But, um, and there, there is some talk about, well, is the university education really worthwhile? Well, setting aside, many of the real reasons why it's great to be educated in terms of being a good citizen, it's also a good investment. And the Ontario Council, or sorry, the Council of Ontario Universities did us a big favor this morning and released the results of a big study about that. So I'd just like to share it with you. Ontario University graduates it turns out have the best labor market outcomes and highest incomes of any, any educational attainment group. And they've experienced the highest employment growth over the last decade, according to the latest University Works report by the Council of Ontario Universities. Data consistently show that Ontario University graduates are securing good, well-paying jobs after graduation, and they're out earning their peers with other levels of education says the chair. Um, and it goes on, over a 40-year period, graduates from Ontario universities, this is historically, earn on the average $1.1 million, that's $1 million, um, or 58% more than graduates from other post-secondary programs, and $1.5 million more than the average Canadian high school graduate. 86% of recent university graduates report working at jobs that require skills acquired um, at university. Now that's good because of course you've all learned some skills and you all have some knowledge. But actually what the report misses is that you've acquired what really counts. <laughs> it's not just what you know when you graduate, it's your capability. It's your capacity to think critically and to to solve problems and to work together and to understand context in the interrelationship between things. It's your passion for learning and learning lifelong, as you will reinvent your knowledge base multiple times throughout life. So this is a great time to be graduating from university and it's a great time to be graduating from Trent. I know firsthand, because it worked for me, that as a Trent grad, you're going to be uniquely equipped and prepared for the exciting and challenging future that lies ahead. And 
in the spirit of the aphorism that the future is not just something to be predicted, it's something to be achieved, I'm confident that in fact you will shape the future. And with your trend experience, I think you do have the tools to take full advantage of the opportunities around you. So this is your moment. Uh, right here today, it's your time to celebrate and to be very proud, but also your time to imagine, to, to design. Think about designing a life that achieves not only prosperity, and as Spock said, go forth and live long and prosper, but perhaps to do more, to live a, a, a purposeful life, to live a life that's principled and that's consequential and that's uniquely your own because the world needs you to do that. So heartfelt congratulations to each of you on reaching this important milestone. And I now declare the convocation open. Good afternoon. My name is Leo Grork. I'm the President Vice Chancellor of Trent University. I did want to share with you uh, that this is my first year at Trent, and this is my first set of Trent convocations. I would say I'm not counting, but this is my 45th university convocation. And I did want to say just at the start how delighted I am with Trent uh, convocations. Uh, they are, and particularly I will say when I compare to convocations at other universities where I was before I came here, they're personal, they're interactive, they pay attention to people. And uh, I think that's one of the values of uh, Trent education in general, that it's a personal education. It builds community, it pays attention to people, and I'm really delighted to see that that's what we do in convocations as well. I'm very pleased uh, to welcome everybody here today, our graduates, our visitors, our parents, their parents, families, supporters. I want to give a special shout out to visitors and especially to international visitors that are visiting us today. And one of the things I've done during Convocation Week is I've uh, been having fun talking to our different international visitors. And I will tell you, I've talked to people from Uganda, Australia, Ireland, Lagos, Ecuador, Nigeria, the Netherlands, the Bahamas, Pakistan, China, Vietnam, and the Ukraine. For those of you who have come from other countries to visit us, a special welcome. My compliments on your wisdom in visiting us now, rather than in February. And the students all know uh, what I mean by that. Uh, if you are here visiting us, I really do want to encourage you uh, not just to come to convocation, but to go around the campus, to walk by the river, Peterborough is famous, among other things, for the history of the canoe. I think can, Peterborough must be the only city in the world with a canoe museum. And I, I will tell you it's worth visiting. And what's even better is if you can get uh, the students who are graduating to take you on a canoe uh, or a kayak to visit the, the river. If you don't want to do that, on the east side of the bank there are nature trails, and I encourage you to visit them. On be, as we begin the ceremony, on an official note, on behalf of the university, I want to acknowledge that we are located in the traditional territory of the Mississauga Anishinaabe, adjacent to the Haudenosaunee territory in eastern Ontario. Especially in a week when Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission will present or has presented its findings on the regrettable history of the residential school system, it is important to honor and recognize the traditional occupants of this land. And I'm, I will say I'm proud to be at a university uh, that does that very well. 
I do want to emphasize at the outset what the ceremony is for, and really the ceremony is about our graduates, about our students. We're all here to celebrate your accomplishments and successes. I want you to, to take a moment, not be shy, and drink that in and enjoy the day. Uh, like everybody in your lives, you'll have good days, you'll have bad days, you'll have some days that are very special days, and I hope that this is going to be a very special day for you. Uh, I will say in celebrating your accomplishments, we're also celebrating the successes and accomplishments of your families, uh, your support networks, your friends, maybe your children, your spouses who are here uh, today. Uh, when everybody leaves, I want you to leave with some sense of what Trent is and what Trent's values are. So at each of the convocations, I'm trying to give some examples of uh, things happening at Trent that just show what a vibrant institution this is. And I think I want to start today by saying, look at these wonderful robes. Uh, these are our PhD students. And I will tell you that at any university, a PhD, Doctor of Philosophy, is the highest accomplishment that can be achieved. And uh, these are a sign of our success as a university, and we take pride not just in the gowns they wear, but who they are and what they have done in order to uh, uh, receive those gowns. I like that applause for the doctors. That's great. Uh, I also uh, wanted to, to repeat something that the Chancellor has said, remind you all that this is the 50th anniversary of Trent. That makes this a very special uh, convocation. It's been a fantastic year of anniversary events. Uh, one has the feeling that it's a sign uh, the university has arrived as an established institution. I want to remind the graduates today of actually another anniversary that's coming up. In 50 years, Trent will be 100 years old. <laughs> now, with most of you, I'm expecting you to be back here in 50 years for the 100th anniversary. I probably won't be there, <laughs> okay? But maybe you can have a toast to me uh, and remember this day uh, at that point. The, for the 100th anniversary. Thank you. Nothing works better at convocation than applause, just to tell you. I, I wanted to highlight one other aspect of uh, Trent today. And maybe I would start by asking, how many people do we have here from Durham? Let's hear it for Durham. Yes, I, I want to remind us all uh, that Trent is a two-campus university. Uh, I like to think of Peterborough as the mothership, but there's an equally important uh, satellite ship uh, in Durham. I would note that as we celebrated the 50th anniversary of uh, the Trent University this year, we also celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Durham campus of Trent University. I think it even gets better. Uh, I would say that that makes us the longest serving post-secondary institution in the Durham region. I want to say that the Durham campus, I think, uh, since I've come to Trent, in my first year, I found it to be a place that's very much alive. It's full of energy. It's full of enthusiasm. It's sitting in the GTA. It's great for Trent University to have that link to the GTA. And I see great things uh, happening at uh, Trent University Durham in the future. I want to make la one last comment to the graduates. Uh, I would like you uh, to remember when today is over that you're still a part of the Trent family. You're just moving to a different segment of the family. 
you'll be members of the Trent Alumni. That's a group of people, 44,000 strong. It's an international group of people, and uh, you will meet Trent alumni wherever you go. And as you become one of those alumni, I hope you'll keep in touch and remember us. Now, Mr. Chancellor, I'm pleased to call upon our Vice President of Finance and Administration, Stephen Piller, to introduce today's convocation speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Dr. Gary Boir is stepping down next month as Trent's Provost and Vice President Academic, and one of his last official duties is to deliver today's convocation address. You're all in for a treat. Dr. Boir's outstanding academic career was launched some time ago, I might add, with a BA from the University of uh, Un Université de Montréal, and then an MA and PhD in English Literature from McMaster University. His teaching experience includes terms at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, the University of Kent at Canterbury in England, and Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario. His min administrative experience includes serving as the founding dean of graduate studies at Lakehead University in Thunder Bay, Ontario, as well as the Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences at Lakehead. Prior to his appointment at Trent, Dr. Boar was the Vice President Academic at the University of Regina in Saskatchewan. For the last five years as the Provost and Vice President Academic at Trent, Gary has worked tirelessly with the deans in order to develop Trent's first academic plan and then the most important part, implementing it. I know Gary's academic colleagues will miss him, his leadership, his sensitiv sensitivity, and his keen wit. I've had the pleasure of working closely with Gary during my three years here at Trent and would publicly like to thank him for his support in my efforts on several administrative fronts. It's my pleasure to welcome Trent's provost and my friend, Dr. Gary Boir, to deliver today's convocation address. Thank you. I expected something very, very different. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. Mr. Vice Chancellor, graduating students, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, members of staff, all those folks in the blue vests who keep this day running. Without them, we couldn't do our jobs. So welcome to you too. To the members of the faculty, whose teaching and research sustain this place, to deans and vice presidents, uh, whom I've had the pleasure to work with, if not daily, uh, and certainly semi-regularly every, every week. And to the boys and girls I've seen uh, in the audience, there's a recruitment package waiting for you on, on, your, on your way out. And I would like to welcome you all to this, this most stunning campus that we have here at Trent. And I want to acknowledge at the outset uh, that I'll be speaking uh, on treaty land, uh, specifically the Williams Treaty. Um, and this territory is the traditional land of the Anishinaabe people, um, which in turn is, as Leo pointed out, adjacent to the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquoian people. And I want to acknowledge both the original inhabitants of this land and some of my dear friends, with deep personal respect, certainly with a respect for indigenous knowledge, a respect for the complexity of indigenous arts and sciences, the intricacies of indigenous philosophies and legal systems, and not least for their traditional teachings on ethics and how to live a good life and how to proceed in a good way. I also respect them for our, their fortitude in the face of crimes committed against them in the Indian residential schools. And we do hope that the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission will be implemented in a timely manner and in a timely manner lead to healing, reconciliation, and the respectful collaboration of equal peoples. Thank you. 
Now, President Grork asked me a short time ago to say a few words today because, uh, as, he, as Stephen mentioned, I'm coming to the end of my position here as Provost and Vice President Academic of this very incredibly interesting research intensive and teaching intensive small personal university. I was honored to be asked, I won't pretend I wasn't, uh, but I'm also very apprehensive of addressing you, uh, our graduating class today. We have PhDs, we have master's degrees, we have an undergrad cohort from Durham, second to none, and you are all extremely accomplished people. Your success stories, and as such, you are quite an intimidating audience. And so, I asked Leo when he asked me, I said, well, yeah, okay, well, what should I say? Now, for those of you who don't know, Leo is by both training and inclination, a very distinguished philosopher. His areas of specialties are ancient philosophy and the rhetoric of argumentation. Don't ever argue with Leo. <laughs> you might want to argue the sky's blue, and you'll, you're right, but you'll lose the argument. Uh, he'll win it on points. Um, and so I knew he'd advise me thoughtfully and well. So when I said, what, do you, what should I talk about? He said, I don't know, it's your problem. <laughs> no, no, he didn't say that. Uh, he, thought, he thought carefully for a moment, and he said, well, why don't you talk about some of the things that you love at Trent and uh, some of the things that you've learned here at Trent over the past five years? And I thought, yeah, cool, I can do that. And so, with apologies to Letterman, um, I'd like to present my own list, um, one for each year, of the top five things at Trent for me, with a little bit of commentary as I go along. So number five... A river runs through it. And certainly the autonomy is, is beautiful in its own right. It's the water, the sacred waters of life. And as Leo intimated, it's, it's a dreamscape for canoeists and kayaks. It's, it's just incredible. But Margaret Lawrence, one of Canada's greatest writers, wrote about this particular river in The Diviners, one of her, her greatest novels. And that book opens with the very famous sentence in Canadian writing, the river flows both ways. Now, that enigmatic sentence puzzled me. It stumped me when I was a very literal-minded undergraduate. I mean, how the, how the heck could a river flow two different ways at the same time? You know, and I remained confused until a very kind Canadianist uh, took me aside, Patricia Salmon in Montreal years and years and years and years ago. Uh, and she said, don't be such a jerk. <laughs> it's a symbol. My life changed at that moment. Of course, it's a symbol in the novel for how life flows both backwards and forwards simultaneously, back into the past, forward into the future at the same time, and how memory of the past flows into the present, and how the present flows into dreams of the future which in turn float back into the present. So in many senses, I think all of us are conduits of our time, sorry, conduits of time. We all contain the past and the present and the future within our own hearts and minds, if not in our own DNA. And as students, you may have studied the thought and events of the past or contemporary realities which you were formed by the past, or if you studied the future, or at least the seeds of the future, you studied how they exist in the present, which in turn will become your past. And I've learned many, many things at Trent, staring at the river as it flows both ways, especially how the past can be a very powerful thing in the present, and that the past can in many ways influence the future. But tradition, as Somerset Mom once wrote, and which my friend David Newhouse continually reminds me, tradition is a guide, not a jailer. So the, path, the past might well help to form the present, but our interpretations are what will determine the future. 
And so remember, always historicize, always historicize. But don't be a prisoner of the past. Interrogate it at every turn to improve the present and particularly the future for generations to come. Number four, the seasoned spoon. The spoon is, for my money, the best restaurant on campus. It's a vegan restaurant uh, that uses organic ingredients that are locally grown, uh, fair trade coffee and tea, and sustainably produced food. And, you know, as, as an ex-Big Mac junkie, I, I had a very suspicious attitude towards it until Mike Alcott of the international section of the university said, well, try it, you know, you might like it. And so I had a bean turnip and red beet wrap with some kind of green stuff on it. And it was, it was incredible. <laughs> it was fantastic. And upon reflection, you know, the spoon is also in many ways a symbol. It's a symbol of Trent. It's a symbol of the Trent values that drive so many of us. Values like sustainability, a respect for the environment, an awareness and a reverence for all life, including animals, a self-awareness of how a healthy mind and a healthy body need to exist in symbiosis, and that both a healthy mind and a healthy body should depend on a just and a fair world of trade and collaboration. So I learned a lot from eating that wrap uh, from the spoon while watching the river flow, and I learned that you might indeed be what you eat, but more importantly, what you eat is the result of many people's labor, which may or may not have taken place in a socially just world, that the environment is incredibly fragile and precious and sacred, and that it's impacted at every moment of every day by even our most basic actions. So I learned that we'd all better start thinking and developing sustainable ways of surviving the climate changes that are affecting this wonderful, beautiful, but quite ailing planet. Number three is convocation. And over the past five years, one of my greatest pleasures has become convocation. I truly enjoy watching the beaming faces come across and the stunned look of which way to go. Uh, and I really enjoy the, some of the amazing footwear. My advice, watch the footwear, um, which are pretty fabulous. But I love convocation because I can see various transformations uh, that have happened over the past three or four, or in some cases eight or nine <laughs> or 15 years. Do you remember your first day at Trent? Do you remember your first essay, the first all-nighter in order to produce your first essay, your first C plus, your first meal at Trent? We won't go into that. Your first discovery of something you never knew before. Your first failure, your first success. Do you look the same as you did the first day at Trent? Are you more cool, less cool? And I've learned from the traditional teachings of the elders that transformations are not only possible, but they're inevitable. Um, I've also learned that transformations never end. Um, your lives and your careers will be an endless series of changing shapes. And so remember to take with you on this journey the wisdom of the medicine wheel, that circle divided into four quadrants of yellow, white, black, and red. And the trick is to embrace change, to embrace transformations, but at the same time maintain a balance of the four quadrants Work hard to maintain a healthy body. Work hard to keep a sober mind. Work hard to balance your emotions. And most importantly, work really hard to sustain a spiritual clarity that will allow you to approach the world with a sense of humor. Uh, certainly, I've never met funnier people than the elders who laugh quite often at my expense. Um, but keep that sense of humor, that sense of wonder, that sense of respect, and try always to live in this good way. Number two, Trent people, hands down. The students, the staff from OPSU, faculty and graduate students from CUPE, the faculty from Tufa, 
and all of the exempt people too. The people who make up this organization care incredibly deeply about each other and about the students in particular and your well-being. And it's this shared commitment that ultimately binds us all together in a common cause. And on more than one occasion, I've seen Paul Hurd, or John, our university painter and carpenter, training students over the summer in summer jobs. They're teaching them how to paint and how to build things, but the more importantly, they're teaching them how to work as a team, a respectful team, with a lot of fun, and a lot of sense of humor, and a lot of hard work. I've seen administrative assistants, like Kathy Fife from Philosophy, picking up a collection to help out needy students, picking up to help a bereaved colleague, and being embarrassed probably that I'm mentioning her name, but that's the kind of people who work here. And I've seen profs and administrators dig into their own pockets to help out students, and I've seen profs go the extra mile more, more than once. So I've learned from folks from all walks of life in this university how to give a damn and how to act on it um, in order to provide the best possible support for each other in the web of relationships that is Trent and that is the world. And I've also learned so much from my own students over the years. And so as you go out, please keep teaching all of those around you and take the time to learn from those people that you're teaching as well. And for these gifts, I will be eternally grateful. And finally, my number one great thing about Trent, my office. <laughs> and I'd like to explain why. I've been an incredibly fortunate in my life, and Trent has been an incredibly large part of that good fortune, even though I've only been here for five years. It seems like hundred, no, no, it's, it's, it's been good. Trent has been very good to me, and I will remain ever grateful for my office. And I'd like to tell you, I'd like to end with a short story about my family, uh, particularly my mom and my late father, that I think explains why I feel so blessed about arriving here at Trent with a job and a river and an office. My father's father uh, maintained a sawmill. He didn't own it, he worked there. He maintained the machinery at the lumber yard in Griffintown, which was the Irish and Italian ghetto in Montreal where I grew up. It was just down from Little Burgundy, which was Montreal's Harlem, uh, where I lived a stone's throw from Rockhead's Paradise, the first jazz club in Montreal. Uh, first club owned by a man of color with a license. It was an incredible place. My mother's father and her grandfather were ice men, as in the ice man cometh. In the winters, my grandpa cut blocks of ice from the St. Lawrence River and stored them in hay bale stables until the end of spring. And then in the summers, he delivered the ice to re restaurants and butchers uh, inch all over Montreal with a horse and wagon. And I kid you not, we had horses in the back and my two grandmothers, uh, well, not, not together, but separately, but in total, uh, had 19 children. There were a lot of mouths to feed. And my mom took a job at the CN when she was 14. And now my dad, he was a World War II vet, and uh, he lied about his age because his, his eight brothers had gone over before him. And so when he was 16, uh, he, he went. And when he got back after the war, he was just 20. Uh, and he scored a job as a night watchman at Dominion Bridge in Point St. Charles, for those of you who know Montreal, also down by the river. So life was good, because we had work, and money was tight, it was, it was really tight, uh, but my family all pulled together, uh, and no one went hungry. Uh, relationships even then, you know, really important. And I grew up wanting to be a milkman. Yeah, a milkman. To have my own horse, my own wagon, and a clean job, and a sit-down job, for most of the day at least. And I didn't think much about having an office in those days. 
Now, I promise I'm not going to veer into a Monty Python skit about how poor we were and how we lived in a box, a cardboard box on the side of the road, because the people behind me, someone will shout out, you had a box? Well, let me tell you how poor we were. So I'd like to fast forward to 1967, when I had what was perhaps the greatest, most spectacular argument with my parents in the history of my family. You see, they had this funny idea that education was very valuable. And they really wanted me to go to university. Because, according to my dad, if I had a degree, I could get a job and I could name my own salary with a university diploma. That was true in those days, not now. But I had other plans. I didn't want to go to university. What a drag. <laughs> I had set my sights much lower than a milkman. And in those days, I wanted to be Keith Richards. <laughs> and unfortunately, sad to say, uh, I worked very hard in those days, very hard indeed, to become one of the walking dead. <laughs> And I said that was my reason. I didn't put it in those words. I said I wanted to be, you know, a musician, which my middle son is now <laughs> today. But all of that was just a smokescreen, and I'm getting to the point of the story. In truth, I was terrified to go to university. Are you kidding? Working class kid? And I was afraid to go because all those rich kids from Westmount and Outremont and town of Mount Royal, you know, the houses would more than one story. <laughs> what would happen when they found out I was from Griffintown? And besides, I wasn't smart enough, I wasn't rich enough, and I didn't have the right middle class pedigree. And they'd easily see that I was an imposter, and that really, I didn't qualify to be a member of their exclusive club. If I think of Groucho Marx, I wouldn't want to be a member of a club that would have me as a member, but. You know. And so during the argument, my dad, he said I was a jerk. And my mom, being my mom's, she called me and she said, you're afraid to go, aren't you? And I was worried about what others would think. And my parents gave me the worst lamb basting I've had in my life about how I should be proud of where I come from. I should be proud of my family, proud that my grandfather was a nice man, proud that my grandfather was, worked on the sawmill and I should go to university and give them hell. And they offered me a deal. My dad was, you know, you've heard Ballad of a Thin Man by Bob Dylan. You stare into the vacuum of his eyes, do you want to make a deal? Well, they offered me this deal. If I agreed to try university for just one year, they would do two things. I had to promise to give it my best shot. The first thing is that they'd pay my tuition and my books for that one year. And when I accepted the deal later, uh, they did. It was $605 for two terms, plus books. And my dad took out a bank loan to pay for it. The second part of the deal, if I accept it and I promise to give it my best shot, they'd buy me an electric guitar. <laughs> <laughs> so I went off to Loyola College, a liberal arts and sciences institution, very, very much like Trent, 650 students. I was 16 when I started, and I was terrified. I was really frightened. But I got through it. I studied theology, B+, plus. classics, B, English, C+, plus. psychology, pass, and French, which I failed, which didn't impress my Francophone father very much. <laughs> but I prevailed. Um, I stopped trying to be Keith, thank God. And I worked my butt off for the next 12 years and beyond. And life happened, three sons happened. I don't know, they just showed up one day, these three guys, you know. Jobs happened, transformations happened. And suddenly, it seems almost like overnight, 
here I am today overlooking the river talking to you. And I've got a job, and I've got an office that I'll vacate soon. And I'm talking to you as you set out to graduate from what, for my money, is the best personal university in Canada. And the moral of the story is quite simple. My office is a symbol, of course. It's a, it's a very powerful symbol for me. On one hand, my parents' faith in me uh, so long ago, and the kind of faith your friends, your family, your brothers, your sisters, your children, your parents, your grandparents, that they've had in you. That's why they're sitting there in the sun baking. And it's the kind of faith I hope that you will also place in your children and your partners and your friends and your loved ones. And that symbol of my office continues to resonate today because it also symbolizes the power of education to create a better future for people personally, but also politically, socially. It's through education that we can address and rectify social inequality, poverty, personal insecurities, ignorance, and the social blight of things like racism and sexism, classism, homophobia, and all of the other paltry little hatreds that pollute the world today. It's through education, it's through your education, I hope, that you really do change the world for the better. You make a difference, you challenge the way you and others think, and you will create a better future from the remains of the day. And so when you go, take good care. Godspeed, good luck. Don't forget about us when you leave Trent, but don't, don't wallow in nostalgia, get on with it. You know, question everything, and most of all, live in a good way. And when you go, please walk very gently upon the earth throughout the many transformative journeys that you'll have. Thanks a lot. Thank you for those words, Gary. Ladies and gentlemen, we turn next to the presentation of candidates for degrees. And graduates and, uh, and members of the audience, I'd just like to explain how this works. The graduates are going to walk in a circle. They're going to be announced by the dean. They will come to the center where they will meet the chancellor. Graduates, that is your moment of glory. Take your time there. You can get photographs taken there. When you're done there, you will walk. I'll be here to congratulate you and Tracy Aladrissi, the university registrar, and other faculty and staff members will be here to greet you. Mr. Chancellor, I would like to ask the Dean of Graduate Studies, Lane Scarf, to announce the, can the candidates for degree. We ask that you hold your applause until all graduates have received their degrees and have been congratulated by the University Registrar, Tracy Aladrisi. Mr. Chancellor, I am pre pleased to present for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy candidates whose names will be read, whom Senate has duly declared worthy of the honor that they may receive the degree at your hands. Jeremy Bell. Amanda Bennett. Mark Browning. Claudia Ciotier. Okay. 
Deneen Denomi. Edward Ellington. Cameron Ellis. Andressa Lacerda. James Anuska. Robert Phillips. David Rappaport. Lana Ray. Joanna Zagoras. Please join me in congratulating the graduates who have received the Doctor of Philosophy degree. <laughs> Mr. Chancellor, I am pleased to pre present for the degree of Master of Arts candidates whose names will be read whom the Senate has duly declared worthy of the honor that they may d receive the degree at your hands. Yushra Al-Bakar. Kimberly Sarah Jean Conroy. Yeah. 
Abigail Downer. Maureen Sarah Elliott. Diana Corell. <laughs> 